I just want to give you a bit of background to myself before I start. Um, I grew up outside Dublin on a family, on a small uh, family farm, effectively, and my father grew bedding plants. So from the early ages of, of um, probably seven to eight, I started filling boxes. And my brother was a student at Warrenstown College at the time, and he was about 12 years older than me. And we had to um, mix our compost by hand with shovel and turn it four ways. And there's no way we could get away with three ways because somehow my dad would know. Um, but everything about that was very basic, it was very simple. My dad used to sterilize sand on fire for seed raising, for bedding, for bedding plants. And he always grew an exceptionally good crop. Um, and, the, and he'd done it in very simple environment, very um, Dutch-like glass, coal frames and polytunnels. Um, and really from that point, um, I suppose I learned quite a lot from him that you can, regardless of the facilities that you have, you can actually grow um, very effective crops. Um, and I see sort of um, the things in the Hortic Week about people reading about what's the most important tools to have. And in my opinion, it's God-given talents such as sight, sound, and touch. Because as growers of ornamental plants, you'll all relate to that really they're the three things that are most important to us. You know, we've got to look at product, we've got to listen to what our staff and what our customers say, as Chris touched on this morning, and we've got to, um, we've got to touch it. So in a propagation time point of view, how many times do we look at prop material, put it in our fingers, and try and um, test the rigidity of that material. So um, I went on from there, I went to Warrenstown College, and uh, I, I uh, studied horticulture in Warrenstown, when it really was Warrenstown for the Irish boys that are here, it was Brother O'Hare and Father Kenny, and who gave me a really good grounding. And that's what they gave me. They gave me a grounding that horticulture was really hard work. Um, it was repetitive, but if you put the effort into it, you'd really um, enjoy it. So um, I went from there to New Place, and contrary to John's belief that uh, it was New Place that kept me in England, it wasn't. I met my wife, and um, she kept me at New Place. And as they say, the rest is, is history. But one of the most important things that John did do for me, apart from passing me on all the great and vast knowledge that he has, um, he introduced me to IPPS. And it wasn't the sort of introduction that was, we think this would be good for you, you're a member. Um, and from that point forward, IPPS has really given me a great gateway to meet some fantastic people in the industry. I've met I've got great colleagues and I've got great friends. So six packers who are here today, this is a great opportunity for you. For people like Judson, I picked him up on Saturday. He's a great guy, he's full of interesting things. We had lots of conversation coming down in the car about um, deep frying turkeys to American military waste. So six packers, this is your opportunity to meet everybody. It's a great thing and uh, I hope it continues for many years. Um, so this is where we are today, New Place Nurseries. In August this year, we became part of the Randstone Group. And um, my title today is going to be talking about Keep It Simple. Um, we're obviously members of IPPS. We've got one of the largest members now as a combined group of IPPS, and we're very proud of that. We're members of the Association of Liner Producers. Um, and my the sort of inspiration for my paper was Les rang me and he said, would you mind giving a paper at the conference? And I couldn't but uh, not help and, uh, Les and, and do a paper for him. I'm very pleased to do so. Um, but about two minutes after putting down the phone, I got a call, uh, I won't say from who or from where, but within our business. And we just overcomplicated things. So I thought, OK, this is the easy thing. Quite often when I go around nurseries, I see people who are getting overcomplicated and they're missing the basic principles of plant production. And that's what I would like to talk about today. So, New Place Nurseries, our locations, we are based in Poolborough, West Sussex, and in Chichester on the south coast. We have um, the South Downs that runs across here. Um, the reason we uh, originally started to grow plants south of the Downs was back when we were growing finished shrubs as a business 
Um, this was for overwinter protect protected space um, to protect from then harsh uh, frosts in winter time, which was before my time at New Place. So the nursery really expanded on the south coast and obviously with the existing nursery at Poolbra. Ironically, is that we would notice a temperature degree difference of about three to four degrees. So in a cold spell, if we get minus four at Poolbra, we get about zero at Siddlesham, um, just because of this south down regions. Also, um, you'll see because of this um, sort of fork off the south coast, the light levels on the south coast are incredibly high, so our ability to produce, and I'm going to talk a lot about mother stock, our ability to produce mother stock um, is, is much greater than we've got at Poolbra. And for those of you who have visited the nursery, you'll see the amount of time and effort that we put into mother stock. Um, so what do we do? We grow trees for the garden centre market. This is Catalpa bignoides aurea grown under polythene at Poolbra. Um, we grow uh, fruit trees, obviously plums, apples, pears, but this is apple trees grown outside at Poolbra. You see the popular, uh, sorry, the popular windbreak at the back. This is ornament, a block of ornamental trees, and this is a whole bed of apples, effectively. Okay? Um, these are produced by two forms. We produce by bench grafting, and we also produce by chip budding, um, which basically splits the, the tree production down. We grow soft fruit for the garden centre market um, across the wide range. I won't bore you with the details. We grow specimen shrubs, again for the garden centre market, across a range, mainly focusing on specific key plants, which are not readily available to, uh, in the market today. But the main focus, and what I'm going to talk about this morning, is our young plants to commercial growers for supply onto sheds, garden centres and retail outlets. This is the main core of our business. So this is what we have, uh, we work very hard on having a reputation for having a high quality, heavy liner product for sale to our customer. Um, this is just an example of some um, liner stock which is taken from one of the recent trade shows. Um, so, some facts and figures for you. What do we do? We have field grown stock of 45,000 square metres, container grown stock of 34,500 square metres, young plants and liners, as you see as the big, well, in proportion of turnover is one of the biggest areas for us, 36,200 square metres, stock beds, you can see quite large, 15,000 square metres. So, based on 100 acres of land in Poolborough, West Sussex, as we've just said, and our indoor, um, so we've got indoor and outdoor production, and we've got seven and a half acres of protected space, i.e. glass, at Chichester, West Sussex. What we grow, we grow 55,000 container-grown trees. That's subdivided into 40,000 ornamental uh, trees. We've got 15,000 soft fruit, 10,000 units of soft fruit, 10,000 specimen shrubs, about 2.2 million young plants all delivered nationwide by our own transport, five 17 and a half ton vehicles, plus trailer units, spreading over 12 production lines, employing 45 full-time staff, and uh, up to probably 10 seasonal staff delivering nationwide on our own transport. So, obviously every business has an aim. Um, our aim is to supply our customers with a high quality product, which provides maximum value and minimum waste and to be our customer's preferred supplier of choice. So effectively, what we're stating is, is that we want to supply our customer with 500 liners of a variety, and from that 500 liners, they'll get 500 saleable plants. It's no good them getting 400 saleable plants and having to grow 100 on for another year, because effectively, that's not what they're paying us for. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about my aim is not to teach you how to suck eggs, but in my experience in visiting nurseries, as I've said earlier, it is quite often the case that the basic principles are missed for overcomplicated procedures. So quite often people are too busy and not focusing on what they should be, and which is the engine room of any business, which is production. Production is what we're, Chris has touched on earlier. Without it, we've got nothing. We've got nothing to sell. We've got dissatisfied customers with poor quality product. So that's what we're about. Can we make a racehorse out of a donkey? Well, the answer, of course, is, is no. 
So when it comes to propagating and then when it comes to production, can we make a racehorse a high quality liner out of a crap cutting? But why do we pot them? So I go up onto our production line and I look at some boarding cuttings and even some cuttings of our own and we're trying to get to the number. Why have we potted them? They're not going to make it. So we've just put waste into our system. So basically what it's about is can we make the racehorse out of a donkey? And the answer is no. We can only make a quality production out of quality product. And that's what we strive to achieve. The pillars of our business, you quite often hear these um, muted around by people just saying, we're built on quality service, value and innovation. Um, just touching on each of them briefly, quality, that's what we're about. That's what we strive to achieve on all sectors of the business and putting the detail into delivering that quality for our customers. The service, it used to be, years, years ago I can remember certain people saying to me, you can sell whatever you grow. 50% of our job now is the service supplying our customers. So our customers will want a liner delivery in week seven. They want it in week seven because that's when their program production is, is there. And that's what Chris touched on earlier. So they want it delivered week seven. They don't want it week 10 or week 12 because you've missed the boat and you've missed their sales time. So it's all about working with your customer so that the service that you're giving them, you're giving them the quality product when they want it. Full stop. Not three or four weeks later. We deal with a living product. We've got problems in production. We all have problems with production. But is your production mapped to suit what your customer wants or what suits you. Value, I got touch, I'll touch on value. Value is um, relating to the obviously price. Everything is price sensitive, but there's more to that. It's the value of experience of our team at New Place, of what, how we send our products, its trueness to type, its quality, and obviously the service and the um, service that we're giving our customers. But Value also relates to what I touched on earlier about the 500 plants that we delivered. When we deliver 500 plants, can our customers sell 500 plants? Because if they don't, they're not getting good value for money. They're only going to get value out of the 450 they sell, and 50 is wastage. Well, that 50 wastage is profit down the drain. So we have, we have this plan that we aim to basically deliver a quality product on time and give a value for money. There's lots of ways to be innovative. Just coming up with a simple idea, I was on a nursery recently where they had a fantastic idea for allowing their staff to um, give, um, put suggestions forward. And then they had a process of how that went through to actually those ideas were then materialized and somebody took ownership of those. So being innovative isn't about just plowing money into machinery. Being innovative is about looking at new products, but also looking at things within the production cycle. And it's often the simple things that would make the most difference. We'd done a lean workshop years ago, and um, one of our guys was in a lean workshop, and he sat there. He's been dispatching trees. And he sat there, and he said, I think the biggest, thing, biggest improvement we could make in the nursery is to put mud guards on the tractors coming in, bringing in trees. Because what, we, what do we do in the winter time? I'm driving around, it's pouring rain, I'm splashing mud over all the trees, and then we've got to spend ages washing it off. That simple suggestion saved us thousands. Just simple little things. So, um, I'm going to talk about quality of liners. That's what I'm going to focus on today because I could go on about lots of different things. But I'm just going to talk about the basic principles that we apply to our business, which helps us grow the product that we grow. So, quality of cutting material, absolutely paramount. Simple. I often go into our prop, and Paul will probably tell you later, and I'm, now he's, to be honest, Paul does a, an excellent job for us on it, is that if the material is not quite right, why are we sticking it? We're just, waste, we're just wasting resources, we're wasting talent, and we're wasting product. So we have spent quite a considerable amount of money in this bit, investing in mother stock. And I'll show you some slides um, in a bit. The quality of the substrate. 
how many people in this room can accurately tell me what's in their propagation medium, down to the grade of their perlite, the grade of their coir, and the peat that's in there, and is it consistent? Timing. Timing can vary from season to season, and we see that, you know, obviously there's a huge benefit in having various computer systems that prompt and tell you when to propagate things. But as we know, this year was very different to last year. And our material is behaving very differently this year than it was last year. And to how we actually plan our production is all done by Excel spreadsheet currently. We're currently looking at um, software which will help prompt us. But the note on this is that we'll only use it as a prompter because it still needs people to walk around, look at it, touch it, and make sure that it's ready to propagate, rather than just sitting in an office and printing off an Excel sheet. Because it's not, it may be too soft, and it may need to be brought forward. And it's all about putting that detail into the timing. <coughs> Absolutely crucial. Preparation is what I refer to as our sticking. So the time that we, we cut material and how we prepare, we'll talk about that more and attention to detail at all stages, adequate control of the rooting environment, and hygiene. My biggest beef is, board sorry Chris, I'm just not referring to you, but my biggest beef is rooted cutting suppliers and weed. When I buy rooted cuttings, why do I want to buy bittercress? I'm not paying for bittercress, I'm paying for rooted cuttings. And this is, that problem is passed on to us, we have to try and tidy it up the best we can, and then that's passed on to our customer. And our customer is becoming more and more on the liner side, and quite rightly so, will go back to the liner producer and ask them for, to pay for it. Because, why should, if I'm selling them a liner, why should I be selling them Bittercress, or Oxalis, or whatever it may be? It's not acceptable. So, our philosophy <coughs> now is to have a zero tolerance because it's just not acceptable for us to buy bittercress. What would I want to buy bittercress for? So, why invest in mother stock? Um, for those of you who have visited the nursery, you've seen some of our stock class houses. Um, obviously, trueness to type. Chris touched on it earlier. Potent tillers, we have a nightmare with at times. People go down to the bed, yeah, bungalow bed, bed two, they go down, they pick it up, put it on a trolley, out it goes. Twelve months later, our customer phones up and says, uh, my, um, our limelight have all come out red. And you look back, and basically the problem most likely has been that they've been picked from the wrong location. Okay? Um, but from our point of view, we have our stock, most of our stock is planted under glass. We do propagate from the liners, so that gives us trueness. There's not everything you can propagate from plants planted in the soil and the glass. But what we do have is um, we can effectively select strains, plant them under glass, and then we can monitor them. We can also plant some new products under glass. It gives us much juvenile and bigger material, which is what I touch on next. And it makes our cutting selection easier as well for our staff. So, for example, Choicey Sundance, we can have 90 foot row planted under glass, that will give us about 25,000 cuttings, okay, when it's ready for harvesting. But it's done at the right time. Rooting percentage of investing, this is mother stock under glass, um, the rooting percentage in a lot of cases can be a lot higher, um, so we found that with certain subjects that we planted stock under glass, where we're getting rooting percentages of 80 to 85 percent, we're now up to 95, and in some cases, Paul will probably tell you later, 100 percent. Um, most importantly is this, investing in mother stock, we have less conflict on sales of young plants. We have more trimmed liners, so we're not reliant on the liners to produce this mother uh, propagation material. We've already got it. We still use it, as I said, but we trim it, and we trim it more often. So providing our customer with the product when they want it, in the best state and condition that it can be. This is some of the shots. This is Pittosporum um, mother stock under glass. You can see there is, uh, this is um, Arundel Green in the centre, some Garnetii, 
This is more stock hedges. So this is an example, 90 feet stock hedge. Um, this is Euonymus Silver Queen, again more Pittosporums. This is Pittosporum Tom Thumb. And then there's some Tabari, I think, uh, down the right hand side there. But effectively, this was planted probably eight, nine years ago under glass. Again, doesn't have to be top of the range stuff. It's just simple um, glass house facilities that um, we basically keep them stock trimmed and then let it run for material when we want. All of the planting was all grouped into disease for disease control. So for example, all the C and Ulthus were together. Um, this was to allow for biological control, pest and disease control, such like. But obviously over the years where we've whipped stuff out and chucked stuff in and whipped stuff out and chucked stuff in, um, we're going, this is ericaceous, this is obviously what we talked about, this is ericaceous stock plants in the glass. So you see um, this is uh, Pierce Little Heath, <coughs> got some forest flame and um, also just down here you can see this is Mahonias, where we've just started to look at Mahonias and then camellia hedges as well under glass, all shaded. To prepare this, um, we had to treat the soil with flowers of sulphur um, to drop the pH, and we put in, I can't remember, but pallets and pallets and pallets of just pure peat. And then we sunk the, uh, sunk the stock in. Um, so, the so basically, all of our periods propagation um, comes off about 50, probably 100 square meters of protected space like this. And that would yield us, just off the top of my head, Paul, maybe 80,000 cuttings, something like that. Okay. Um, control over substrate. I might be a bit controversial on this one. Um, but the reason we bought this was we had no control over the plugs coming into us. We had no control over the substrate. We didn't know really what was in it. Um, it was variable. Um, and we weren't getting the quality of product supplied to us. When what we wanted. And that's why we bought this. So we bought the Alley Guard machine. It paid for itself within, certainly within the first two seasons. This is an example of our four centimeter plug, um, which we make, uh, which is a peat, perlite, and coir compost. Grade of perlite, um, I'll let you to chat to Paul to later in the bar. He can give you a lecture on grade of perlite. Um, but absolutely crucial. And what really got to me was is that how little understanding some of the suppliers had of the importance of this to us. Why would we go and stick a rooted cutting that we've invested all of this money in, in something we had no control over? It's very simple. So, going back to basics, it's having control over your own destiny. So this machine, you can see this is the one of the 100 rolls here, which is fungus-coated fungus um, paper. Um, it's very simple, conveyor belt in, into the hopper, down. Um, Paul will give you the output per hour, um, probably about 3,500 plugs per hour. But the value of this is unquantifiable to us, because what it's doing is doing what we want, when we want it, in the substrate that we need. We can, vary the, we can vary the nutrition if we want to, we can alter pH, we can do what we like. We couldn't do that before. And we were getting inconsistency in supply. And I know some of the, co some of the plug suppliers may take me to charge over that, but that's how we found it. And that's why we changed. Continual improvement, that what slide meant to go in before this. This is um, an acre of glass down in Siddlesham that is now ready for planting. You can see it's thermal screens, uh, sorry, shade screens. Um, it's just been um, sterilized, but just simple, basic thing. We wanted to plant mother stock into it, so we had it tested. It came up positive for verticillium, so we sterilized it. Okay, so we're going into a sterilized environment. Again, they will be planted in rows. Again, it will all be planned pretty meticulously, again, to give us, to group stuff together from a P&D point of view, from a harvesting point of view, and most importantly from this, from a shading point of view. Um, plug selection. Plug selection has become absolutely vital for us now, which you'll see in a minute, and I want to talk about transplanting. On the left, this is a Jiffy glue plug. 
It's in our own mix. I think Stephen will probably tell you about it later. Um, I think is it our mix, Stephen? New place? Yeah. Paul? Yeah. 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 Um, Paul and Stephen put this together. This is Paul's handiwork, um, which is basically peat coir and perlite. Um, and we use it for a certain element of our propagation. And this is the difference. This is our propagation medium here. You can see very coarse perlite, but again, very consistent. So importance of plug selection is obviously si size and strength of material, the longevity of the plug prior to potting. So in our case, is that if we're going to ship it through quickly, if it's a same season liner, it's a glue plug and it bangs through the transplanter and it's gone. Most important for us is how this now fits into the production cycle with regards to transplanting. And I'll make the point, if you change one cog, all the gears fall apart and you've got to realign them and put them back together again. So effectively now we're working faster by being smarter. Um, so preparation, cold store facility set at six degrees, very simple, an old container unit that basically has the, uh, that we store our material in. Most important of all, our experience team. For those of you who have visited New Place, you know we've got a very long standing um, members of staff who provide a completely unique um, and uniform cutting when you go out on the mist. They're hugely important when it comes to this, educating agency labour. We need to use seasonal labour like every other business, but it's absolutely vital that these two connect, which they do. Hormone selection, unfortunately I don't think Keith is here today. Um, we use Rhizopon and then we select what Rhizopon is suitable for that cutting, if any. That's what I say, if any. And if any of you want any more detail on that, again, I'm not shoveling it off, but I won't be here later, but chat to, chat to Paul. And then the application of hormone. You know, I mean, <sighs> dipping time. You often go on to nurseries, people are preparing cuttings, dip and they stick. And they think because they're dipping and sticking really quickly, they're doing a really good job. But they're not because they should be dipping for three seconds to allow the hormone to um, come up. And it's simple, basic things that, that, that are missed that have a, just a detrimental effect on any <coughs> production cycle. Um, misti sorry, misting directly after sticking prior to going out on the mist. Um, you'll see here, this is the simple hose system with a mister on. So the cuttings are misted on the bed, on the, on the uh, trailer before they go out to the machine. And then, of course, bed preparation and sterilization. So preparing our beds, making sure they're sterile, the nozzles are clean, the simple things that you go onto nurseries and they're just not done.
Saka Cocker Winter Gem, um, Choicey White Dazzler, and that is it. Thank you very much.